And we're going to turn quickly now to our next panel. Um, so we have uh, seven speakers who will each have five minutes. Um, I want to uh, impress upon you how impressive this group is as individuals, as scientists and administrators at their respective uh, organizations, and as they are leads in the COVID response um, on the ground. And I don't want to take any of their time that you could be listening to them. So I'm going to turn it over to our first person. Creston, you ready to go? That I am. I'll share my screen here. Thank you very much for the introduction today. I'm happy to be able to talk about what we were doing at the CU Boulder campus for actually adding on some of additional surveillance techniques. And this is the CU Sioux, the campus sewer monitoring for SARS-CoV-2 across the campus. And so the outline of what I'll be talking about is a brief history of the project, what the current monitoring actually looks like across campus, the utility and usage of data, and some of the future directions. So one of the inspirations behind this project is that an estimated about 40 to 80% of those infected with SARS-CoV-2 actually shed either the RNA or the viral particle through the fecal matter. And so this allows us to have a more community passive and semi-anonymous signal that we can monitor within the manholes. And this is something that's actually becoming much more popular across the entire country. So if you follow on Twitter, COVID poops 19, they keep track of all the different campaigns. And so there's about 39 dashboards. And then across the entire global region, there's 182 universities that are pursuing a method of monitoring on campus. At the University of Colorado Boulder, we have 20 locations identified on campus to really concentrate on the signal of the residential halls. There we have 23 continuous pumps that are actually set up and we self-designed these to have a more economical system to have a wider grid of continuous monitoring. And on a daily basis, we actually come out and sample for the wastewater that's pulled up. What's really great about this project is it's actually been a completely student run effort. And it's one that we collaborated extensively with our on-campus safety units to ensure that everyone had the proper protective equipment as well as the proper training to be able to handle sewage material that not only has SARS-CoV-2, but also all of your rhinoviruses and adenoviruses and all of the other bacterial material that's moving through. Once we brought this material back to the lab, we would concentrate the viral particles, and then we would specifically target the quantitative polymerase chain reactions to be able to monitor a quantitative signal for SARS-CoV-2. And we'd check for both the nucleic capsid as well as the envelope RNA fragments. We would normalize this to the human RNA P fragments that were also available within the waste streams. Zooming in on one of the events that we actually had on campus and really highlighting what uh, Rachel was actually indicating before is that in the university structures, it, at the middle of September, we did have a surge on campus. The heat map that you have here is actually monitoring the envelope signal from the different manholes. So along the y-axis, you have all the different manhole locations. Along the x-axis is the progression of time from when we began in August all the way up to Thanksgiving. And when you see a darker red color, that's a higher concentration. A lower pink to white color is actually a lower concentration and then gray glow goes below our signal detection. And so initially you do see much darker reds in the period in September, as well as some returns right before Thanksgiving. And this really tracks well with the data that we had for the on-campus monitoring techniques. So we had both a saliva campaign set up for daily samplings that were going on for on a rotating basis for the dorms, as well as on-campus uh, PCR direct nasal swabs. And you see that the signal from the sewers lines up directly with the surge that we saw in September, as well as the increased prevalence right before Thanksgiving. One of the ways that we really approach to interpreting this information and providing it as a value added to what other monitoring campaigns are on campus is that we really look at it as a way to have an early warning signal if you start seeing community increases. So if the virus is initially absent or is the virus present, but then also when you have a post peak event is to see if there's an effective response to whatever a new implementation strategy you are to tackle the pandemic. So currently that's where we really see the most value added for a sewage monitoring campaign. And so come wind and snow, there's almost no rain events that occurred during the fall semester here in Colorado. We are out there sampling and picking up the material. 
and it's one where it's we're gearing up for the spring semester as the uh, University of Colorado Boulder is welcoming students back on the second week of February. This is a very large effort because of daily sampling out there it, and also employing something that was very new required collaboration of facilities, as well as a lot of scientific and just industrial support as well. So with that, I'll just briefly thank everyone. And if you have any questions, I look forward to the panel discussion. Great, thank you so much. That was very efficient. Um, I'm gonna turn it just immediately over to you, Paul. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. I'll be talking about our efforts here at the University of Illinois to develop and implement a high volume uh, testing regimens for SARS-CoV-2. So uh, some of the guiding principles as we got into this, we knew that 50% of the spread is from people that do not have symptoms, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people. And this is stylized here. So if at day zero, you get symptoms, as we heard from our first speaker, you uh, have the virus and are probably shedding for several days before that. And so this is why things like uh, temperature checks do not work for controlling disease and testing or isolation merely of symptomatic individuals will not control the spread. Uh, we also knew that uh, for us, saliva seemed to make the most sense as a sample medium. We are all wearing masks because of the particles that are coming out of our mouths. Uh, these are salivary and respiratory droplets and aerosols. And so we really wanted to test the medium that was most responsible for the transmission. So our goal was to develop a saliva test that we could use frequently, that is multiple times a week, to test everybody multiple times a week for this virus. So uh, the standard method for testing that we know about is from the swab and viral transport media, uh, RNA isolation and purification, and then RTQPCR. And many times during the pandemic, many of these items have been limiting RNA isolation kits, swabs, viral transfer media. They also add costs. They also add time. Also for uh, NP swabs, one needs a healthcare worker. We were inspired by uh, a report from Rutgers we saw in April where they were able to show that one could detect the virus in saliva. In this case, they use specialty collection device and RNA purification kits to RTQ-PCR. So we set out as our goal to develop a process, a very simple process through cheap collection devices, bypassing RNA isolation and purification and right to RTQ-PCR. And so this was our goal for our test, uh, saliva test bypassing these supply chain limiting pieces. This requires the development of a new test and such a test was not out there. Really critical for us was fast reporting of results so we could isolate positive individuals very quickly. This requires an on-campus CLIA lab and my colleague, Professor Tim Fan stood this lab up at our vet med facility. Also, we needed to run this. We have a large campus and we wanted to test everyone multiple times a week. We needed to be able to run over 10,000 samples a day. And this requires, how do you collect anything from 10,000 people a day it requires an efficient process. So uh, my colleague, Marty Burke leads our overall shield effort, target test and tell. I lead the test part and early on in the test development, he sent me this logo where he had helpfully put, uh, put test in all caps. And he sent me a message that said, uh, failure is not an option with respect to our test development. So we set off in early May on this project, this Manhattan project style effort to develop this test. We knew we had a very short amount of time and I set out to recruit individuals from diverse scientific backgrounds for what I knew would really be an intense all out effort, a six week sprint. And these, this, this has been an amazing team and, and really fortunate to have them and, and they've made a, a really, really uh, important discovery. And so what the team did was to look at different buffers, times, temperatures, and they ended up with a process where we have a very simple process where we take the, the tubes containing saliva, heat them at 95 C for 30 minutes, then add TBE tween buffer and can go right to RTQ-PCR. This heating of samples does a few things. It opens up the virus, allowing access for the primers. It also inactivates inhibitory components in saliva. Most critically, it inactivates the virus itself. So uh, no, no worker in the lab opens tube that has active virus and it makes it very safe to do on this scale. We put out our manuscript in mid-June uh, to enable other institutions to adopt this protocol. And we're really very pleased that many other institutions are now following this blueprint and in some cases this exact protocol. 
So just quickly on the limit of detection. So this is a standard swab RNA purification RTQ-PCR from Berkeley. You see a limit of detection of about a thousand viral particles per mil. Ours is saliva bypassing RNA isolation. Uh, and we have a limit of detection of about 500 to a thousand viral particles per mil. We have, uh, we use the, the COVID path system. We amplify three genes and we retest all positives from the original sample, uh, giving us a very, very uh, low rate of false positives. So the logistics of testing 10,000 people a day, the campus has been amazing with this. They've set up about 20 collection sites on campus. Every hour on the hour, a car drives through these collect samples and brings them down to our CLIA lab where they're immediately processed, return the results in 10, uh, five to 10 hours. We've run as many as 17,000 samples in a single day and a million samples total. This is an example of one of our outdoor tents and these have now moved inside uh, with the colder weather. Um, so the results reporting is all positives are retested. As I mentioned, once the retest is confirmed, they go through our health center and to the Safer in Illinois app. So this is an app developed by my colleague, Bill Sullivan. This gives you the results. So we all have this app and we get this result on our phone. This app is really critical combined with in-person classes. This compels compliance with the twice weekly or three times weekly testing we require for undergrads. So this app gives you access to our building. So we have someone at all of our buildings looking at your phone. If you have building access granted, that means you have a recent negative test and you're allowed to go in. So this has been very effective here as per PhD or public health. We've had no hospitalizations or deaths and no spread from the campus to the community. So here's our dashboard. This shows uh, the testing per day. So up to 17,000, we've kind of have an average of, of over 10,000 a day during the weekdays. Uh, like everyone, we had a spike when students eventually, when students first return, we we're able to dramatically lower this through frequent testing and isolation to about 0.02% during the warm uh, weather days. Even as the weather got colder, our, our percent positive is typically below 0.5%. We see spikes at the holidays and we were able to, to drive that down. So moving beyond uh, UIUC, uh, Shield T3 was launched to bring this technology to others. They have launched mobile labs. So these are the labs on a truck. My colleague, Professor Abby Woolridge designed these. Uh, one of these is at UW-Madison running 10,000 a test day for there for the University of Madison. Another one of these is in the Bay Area running tests for companies and schools in uh, the San Francisco area. So that's what I wanted to tell you. We have a, a convenient and simple protocol, no supply chain limiting reagents, We've done it on over a million samples here. We return results in about five to 10 hours. We test the medium that we think is most important for disease spread. And we have a, a group of individuals that we're testing every day with both saliva PCR and the antigen test. And I can tell you that the, the saliva PCR test is maybe 100,000 times more sensitive. It'll detect positives two to three days before the antigen test. And sometimes people are, are symptomatic and are still not positive with the antigen test. We're a big believer in PCR testing uh, through, through saliva. So thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Paul. David, you're up. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start off here by sharing my screen. Um, I'm Dave, David Luzzi from Northeastern University. And I'd like to talk about uh, how Northeastern approach and I, Paul's talk was a fabulous lead in uh, because uh, we use the same uh, Fisher, Thermo Fisher TAC path uh, system for, for reverse transcriptase quantitative uh, PCR polymerized chain reaction testing as University of Illinois. And uh, that had that, so everything he has told you about that applies to Northeastern. So I can build on that talk. Uh, so the, the, uh, when Northeastern approached uh, this, we started very early on. Actually, we were the first university in the country to declare that we would open in the fall. And that was back in May. Uh, we took a, always have taken a science-based data-driven approach. And uh, we are one of the five uh, universities uh, with uh, four in the United States, uh, Northeastern, Harvard, Columbia, University of Washington, and uh, Imperial College London that has informed the World Health Organization, the CDC, and the White House Task Force back in the spring on the epidemiological evolution of uh, COVID and the pandemic. And if you remember, it seems like ancient history now, but the whole flatten the curve uh, issue was indeed coming out of the modeling done by these five universities. So we were engaged, but we applied this capability that we have in our, in our Network Science Institute at the state level for Massachusetts, at the city level for Boston, and at the university level for Northeastern right from the beginning. The challenge that we have that University of Illinois does not have so much is that we are intimately embedded in a major city and not just a major city, 
a major city that was one of the ground zeros for COVID coming into this country. So that has been a continuous challenge. And of course, we had to deal with a lot of, of um, uh, angst, if you will. Uh, and also people have to be aware that, you know, in Massachusetts, higher education is the second largest industry. Uh, so it is a big deal in Massachusetts and with an enormous number of young people being imported into the state, there was a lot of, of managing of expectations and setting up confidence, building confidence with the community and with the politicians in order for us to be able to open in the fall. So it's been a major success story in Massachusetts and, and actually the sum total universities in Massachusetts provide a model for the country and the world in terms of what you can do systemically, society-wide using frequent testing. So right from the beginning, we understood we had to control, we had to control behavior. Uh, so there's of course famous examples. Northeastern was the university that rescinded admission to a group of students that claimed they were gonna party. And we required them to sign in everything but blood that they would not do it in order to get their admission back. And then uh, when students arrived, there was the famous uh, group of 11 that was caught having an uncontrolled gathering and they were all expelled from the university for the semester. So that strong messaging in the beginning did a long, made, went a long way to controlling the behavior of our students. Prevention, obviously, you know, as part of the campaign, huge issue uh, in terms of mask wearing, face, uh, safe distancing, et cetera. And then implementing frequent testing, understanding the science of the virus, understanding its transmission cycle and recognizing that we had to get testing with inside that, free, uh, that, uh, that transmission cycle of the virus. So like uh, University of Illinois, we spun up our own CLIA certified lab uh, and uh, had that lab up and operational in the summertime. And we have been done a lot of tests. And then the last thing is to be ready for vaccination. So months ago, we put in place two task force uh, to get ready for vaccination. And we were one of the first universities in the country to get some vaccinations done this week. Uh, and just to give an indication of how ready we are with no notice, we had a call from the state that they had 200 Moderna uh, doses ready for us. And three hours later after that notification, we had needles going into skin uh, with vaccinations, uh, all within three hours um, ready to go. And uh, that meant having the people knowing who was gonna be vaccinated first, ready to go. Okay, so I just want to, you know, to give an indication of how successful this has been. This is from the Massachusetts dashboard for uh, yesterday. And you can see here on this chart on the top right, Massachusetts has separated out the universities because the universities are testing so frequently and have got the virus so much under control within their campuses that they actually skew the state's results. So, uh, so actually that bottom line there is the, uh, is the rate of uh, coronavirus positive uh, test results at the universities. Uh, but you can see that uh, the universities here in the, in the words here, you can see one of these green numbers. Uh, so far universities in Massachusetts in the fall semester have run 3.4 million tests. All of those tests are, um, or the vast, vast majority of those tests are uh, PCR tests. So, uh, so this is an ongoing uh, thing. We've had the uh, same thing with, with uh, University of Illinois experience, no hospitalizations. Uh, we have had um, uh, very interestingly in the first half of the fall semester, more than half of our students were completely asymptomatic. They were uh, discovered as positive, isolated uh, in dorms. And I can show you just three charts here to kind of show you the uh, test rate, positive test rate and number of positive tests and total number of tests. This is the daily total number of tests run. And you can see that uh, we've had a very low positivity rate. You can see the Thanksgiving holiday uh, right here. Uh, and you can see as soon as we went to very low numbers and we started having only students who were living off campus coming in for testing, you could see, well, Christmas day, we had almost no tests. Those were kids coming in who felt, felt sick we, we spiked to 2.2% or 2.4% uh, positive rate. That was Christmas day. But uh, other than that, you know, even with this uh, tapping into this community that is more exposed to Boston, 
we are still running uh, at a very low test positive rate uh, versus Boston. And uh, this is just the total number of positive tests. To give you some statistics, we've had about um, uh, 600 positives total. We've had 78% of those are students. And of course, built into our program is very aggressive co uh, contact tracing. So as soon as a student tests positive, they are, or anybody, they are isolated. Uh, contact tracing is done immediately. And in our contacts, we've had a positivity rate of just over 10% of our close contacts. We've had one case of transmission in a classroom, and that was two students not wearing a mask. We don't, still don't know how the heck that happened uh, in terms of students being allowed in the classroom not wearing a mask. But uh, that did happen once, and there was a transmission there. Um, but other than that, uh, through, through you know, thousands and thousands of student uh, episodes of in the classroom, we've had zero transmission in classrooms. So overall, a very safe environment. And that concludes my talk. Beautiful, thank you so much, David. Brian, you're up. Great, thank you very much. So uh, Everbridge has been working on, since this outbreak happened, we've been working on contact tracing from the very early stages. Uh, we're now moving into not only contact tracing, but also vaccine scheduling and administration for appointments and things of that nature. But just to, to talk on the contact tracing piece here, uh, we do it through several different uh, proprietary to Everbridge sources. Uh, so not only can you leverage the Apple Google um, side of it for public contact tracing, but for, for private or on the university side, the contact tracing, uh, we leverage you know badge access, we le leverage the GPS from a mobile device, uh, Wi-Fi signals, and then finally the proximity tracing. So that we're, we're taking a more holistic approach in that end-to-end -end contact tracing solution. Uh, so we did develop an app in order to be able to do and facilitate the proximity-based tracing. Again, like I said, you could leverage that Apple Google framework, but we're mostly using our proprietary framework um, that Everbridge created. Uh, on the location-based, uh, things like your mobile GPS or your badge access or the Wi-Fi, uh, and even calendars and scheduling uh, for that known location where someone's going to be and how many people will be at that location. Uh, and then even to preventing exposures through area monitoring. Are there too many people in a specific area? Uh, being able to monitor that density that helps maintain a proper social distancing. So all of this filters into a specific contact database for an uh, individual, uh, minus the photos that was just added for a little extra flair. Um, but the be able to understand not only where somebody is, where somebody's going to be, where somebody has been, uh, some of the different information about them from a university perspective, such as, you know, um, where they live on campus, uh, different classrooms that they're going to be in, or uh, dining facilities and things of that nature. So all of the information uh, allows you to understand not only their static location, their last known location, and then based on their scheduling, you know, their expected locations in the future. Uh, this goes into, the, like I said, the, that uh, pretty robust database to understand not only how many contacts may be in a specific location at a specific time. Uh, so you know if they're too close together, you can notify them. There's too many people in this area. Um, contacts that were found in the same location after uh, a contact was there. So you understand now who was in that location. Uh, and then contacts that were found uh, before contacts were there. So taking a good understanding of a specific location or locations understanding who was there, when they were there, how many people were there, you know, and then the, the different area. Okay, so all of that goes into how the app will work to notify people if they're uh, in close proximity to somebody or if they've been exposed uh, to somebody. So the exposure uh, co uh, proximity contact tracing workflow um, so the uh, person, the student or uh, citizen would download the mobile app. Uh, it's running on their app. You know, the Bluetooth proximity is basically exchanging like a key between the two people. If they're in that six foot proximity for a 15 minute or more uh, exposure time, uh, it then exchanged that key. So each person each day is putting out a unique key. Uh, now, if somebody does end up testing positive, uh, that key can then go back and say, okay, how many people have I exchanged keys with in the past, you know, 30 days or, or the, the time frame that, or 14 days, the time frame that is set up. And it will let them know, 
you've been potentially exposed to somebody who has self-reported as having uh, COVID-19. This now allows them to understand, you know, their exposure rate, you know, and start working on that overall contact tracing uh, perspective. This was pushed out back in August of 2020 uh, and has been working pretty well uh, for those who have it. It is a completely automated workflow process. So uh, it's configurable on the front end uh, for you and, and how you want it to work, how the administrator is going to access the information, how the uh, information is gonna be used and exchanged throughout the system. Okay, so identity, identity uh, positive cases from the self-report. Uh, when you take the app, you're just simply going in and you're answering a series of questions. Uh, you're self-reporting the date that you tested positive. Um, and then this is what sets off that reaction that then goes back and notifies the people who you've exchanged keys with that they have been exposed to somebody. It does rely on somebody to uh, honestly self-report that they are exposed. Uh, but from an employee, a constituent level, you know, from regional policies uh, and privacy concerns, there is no PII that's ever exchanged between the mobile app users. Uh, there's no way for them to know who the person was that they were around, the exact specific date that they were around that person, right? All of that PII is kept confidential. Nothing is exposed or uh, passed along to anybody else. Uh, it does allow for some granular access controls, specific permissions for the contact tracing, you know, and then that self-reporter can be set to an organizational setting to be able to remain anonymous completely or so that the uh, organization itself can understand who it is who tested positive or, or is reporting positive so that they can do an even more robust contact tracing if they need to or have a better understanding of who they need to talk to, talk with. From a, a security perspective, this is a fully HIPAA compliant system. Uh, our platform is also FedRAMP authorized for privacy and security. And then for, because this is a global um, process, it is also GDPR compliant and, and, and cloud-based compliancy. Uh, from the overall perspective on a, on a workflow, so when somebody goes through and, and they do, um, they can answer a series of questions as to whether or not, you know, it's safe for them to return to work. And based on their answers in the workflow, they get back some sort of instant uh, validation as to whether or not it's safe for them to return to work. So from a daily wellness check perspective, you know, the person fills out and completes the wellness check on the app uh, based on their answers and based on the workflow process, it either approves them to continue moving on to the facility, or it says to them they're not eligible to return to the facility at this time. Uh, they then can be scanned for any type of uh, temperature reading sensor, which can also go back into the app and then also approve them uh, to enter the building. From there, you can do things like if they're not approved, uh, turn off their access to, their, um, to the doors and things of that nature so that they cannot get into the building and expose other people. Uh, and then a self-contained exposure for case management solutions uh, we have set up the system where uh, you can further broaden your reach and understanding from a population standpoint, you know, who self-reported, has it been contained? Are there still areas where you need to be concerned? You can run all of the exposure scans and risk assessments within the platform, you know, and then understand who needs to be quarantined effective immediately and how that process is going to work out. Uh, all right, so, and then finally, a uh, couple slides here on the end um, is just how that symptom checker, checker works all together. So again, here's a little view of the ability to uh, understand if somebody have a cough or are they shortness of breath, are they fatigued? They'll answer the questions based on the CDC guidance and guidelines. Uh, that goes into the app, as you can see on the left-hand side, you can have the customizable buttons to understand what are my, my workplace priorities, what are my guidelines? Um, you know, are there regulations they must follow and, and uh, follow up symptom checks and things of that nature? You can set these to be automated where, you know, they're doing things on a daily basis or they may be asked uh, to take this wellness exam two, three times a day, once a day, once a week, however you want that set up on your end. Uh, it's, again, completely configurable as far as those questions and then the workflow process behind it. So the idea behind it is the answer to question number one facilitates what question number two and so on is going to be, you know, based on your previous answers. Uh, it's fully automated, uh, the analytics and alerts. Uh, we do density monitoring. We're doing temperature imaging monitoring and managing building codes from the ventilation, the humidity levels, all of that is stuff that goes into the platform 
to give you a better understanding of your entire facility, how it's operating, what your risks are, where your exposure risks potentially are, you know, and then how people are being reported and, and all the, the entire contact tracing um, side of it. So with that, I will pass it back over to you and I appreciate your time. Great, thanks, Brian. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Karine. Just give me a second. Many of us use uh, contact tracing at all of our different universities, uh, but some of us who can't do quite what Illinois is doing with a million tests in a term uh, need to use different strategies. So at DU, we, we leveraged uh, multiple layers of using um, uh, nasal swab testing, uh, sewer monitoring, and then forward contact tracing and backward contact tracing. So I just wanna share a little bit of what we've done. Forward contract tracing is actually finding all the people that a sick individual could have passed the virus onto and asking them to quarantine or isolate. Um, it's, a, it's the traditional close cap contract tracing process. Backward contact tracing can actually, when coupled with forward contact tracing, give you two or three times more efficiency in identifying effective uh, infected individuals. And it's really looking at um, finding people who might have given the virus to that person who has been tested positive, instead of looking just for those that they would make sick. This is an alternative, like I said, to high frequency testing. It takes a lot of effort and algorithms. Really what you're doing to do this is to create subpopulations. And that was our strategy here at the University of Denver. We were looking at subpopulations and tracking their positivity, um, understanding uh, how the cases were rising in these subpopulations. So you could look in terms of dorms, you could look at the, the suite or the wing of a dorm, the floor of a dorm, maybe a cohorted community within a dorm. You might also look at class scheduling or classrooms. Um, you would look at majors, maybe levels, undergraduate, graduate. Um, you might look at the divisions they were sitting in or the business units, the buildings they were attending or working in. You could look at co-curricular activities. You could look at events or experiential learning activities. So by creating these different subpopulations and monitoring them, you could quickly identify sort of groups that might be of concern and begin to target them um, in, a, in a proactive way for testing if you thought uh, positivity was rising. So this is really um, a pattern recognition approach. Um, it's not dependent on the tracing uh, interviews. So it can happen actually simultaneously and independently. Um, the tracing data can be merged, and we did that later in the quarter, which actually really helped to refine and narrow the target group. But what you do as positivity rises, or maybe you find out uh, compliance issues that Northeastern talked about, or your wastewater data, uh, like Boulder was talking about, um, may indicate that you should put them on nightly um, watch lists. So now you're going to monitor these subpopulations more frequently and with great uh, more intentionality. Um, subpopulations could be huge, right? You could start off with thinking um, they could be uh, 300 to 1,000 individuals. Um, but what you really want to do is to narrow that group or that subpopulation into a smaller group, something that can be tackleable, something around 30 or 80 that makes sense. So I wanted to share just a couple of examples. Um, one of our examples was using wastewater as a trigger and then using backward contract tracing to control a potential outbreak. So there was a wastewater uh, measurement in a residence hall at about uh, 1 p.m. in the afternoon that uh, indicated elevated levels of the virus within that dorm from that morning. Um, we estimated that was somewhere between 10 or 15 people. It was still very small, uh, but if you didn't control this quickly, this could quickly get out of control in a congregate living environment. Um, so what we did within the hour was request that all the residents within the building go to testing. Um, and the compliance was just amazing um, to get all the individuals, you could actually see it on our cameras immediately upon receiving the email, took it proactively upon themselves to show up at the testing facility and be tested. What we found were within, um, you could imagine quick succession, uh, we found the 10 positives that we were looking for. Um, and what you see in the graph below is the wastewater elevated result precedes when we actually identify or report 
the individuals who are, are um, found sick or test positive. And this is because the wastewater told us that it was going on. Then we used testing to be able to find it. What was really interesting is we could dig down deeper. This was an area where we actually really learned how to do our backward contact tracing to narrow a group uh, subpopulation from 400 to a much smaller group, somewhere around 80 or 30, was using the connectivity of the residents um, uh, via different records. Uh, maybe their co-curricular activities could be violations. Um, it could be events. Um, at when we post looked at this data, this is where we really realized the power of this technique. That in fact, by leveraging other pieces of data and bringing them in, you could pick out very quickly a smaller, um, higher risk population because of um, sort of activities that people actually attended and were a part of who may have not shown up in contact tracing because uh, maybe they didn't know the names of the individuals. They didn't know all the people that were there. Um, and this technique actually allowed us, our wastewater returned uh, to very low levels very quickly the next poll. Um, but really the, the caseload went down really quickly in the dorm and we brought it back to normal levels in, in a very, very efficient manner. So this is an example where you use wastewater, but you can also use it in the classroom where we were watching and the number is wrong. It is 17%, not 217%. You can look at classrooms and positivity rates in classrooms and when they exceed what would be the normal amount for that classroom. Um, we did investigations of all the environmental effects but really what it turned out to be was this watching subpopulations. Um, we first thought it was majors and sent periodic testing to certain majors to try to identify those majors that were in those classrooms. But it actually turned out to again be the co-curricular and event populations that could reduce it even to smaller numbers. So you went from thousands of students when you went to majors to hundreds of students, but when you went to real event populations, you were talking 20 students. So these are very powerful techniques that can actually um, help you leverage your testing in order to control your um, outbreaks. I'm done and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Karine. And we will turn it over to Erin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not turning on my camera because I'm having some data connectivity, but feel really lucky to have followed Corinne because the story that she told I think was the secret sauce at the University of Miami in terms of our ability to keep the university campus open the entire semester. So before I get into um, what I'm showing here, we organized a robust public health response that had four pillars, testing, tracing, and tra tracking and televigilance. And today I'm going to speak mostly about tracking because as I referenced earlier, it was really critical to our ability to understand where exposure was occurring and to intervene in real time. One of the things that we developed early on was a big data set, if you will, where we were able to take disparate um, data that traditionally had existed in silos and figure out what the common point of connection was so that we could integrate them into a larger data set that would really give us the 360 degree view of both campus and our student population. And so what that meant was taking information from the student record and being able to merge it with the health system data, which is where the testing was occurring. As a point of reference, we were testing stu our residential students um, about every week and our non-residential students about every 10 days. We had very robust contact tracing that used forward and backwards methodologies, but at the end of the day, our big data and our ability to monitor this data in real time was what ultimately drove um, our, our, our management of transmission across campus. So similar to what Corinne was speaking about, we were able to really look at this, the number of new cases by our various schools and colleges and what you see here, and I'm sorry, the oval moved up a little bit, is our school of communication happens to be a very small school of enrollment relative to some of the other schools on this table. Miami Herbert Business School and the College of Arts and Sciences have our highest enrollment across the university. The school of communications is much smaller, but it had a disproportionate number of new infections relative to student size. And so when we would see data like this, we would take a pause and then really try to delve in to figure out what would help us understand what was occurring, whether this was a real potential sort of outbreak that was school-based 
or it was a statistical artifact based on something else that was occurring across the university community. And what happened with regard to the School of Communication is that a disproportionate number of School of Communication students actually reside off campus. And across the semester, 70% of all of our new cases occurred in non-residential students. So what we found by looking at the data was that this pattern of infection had nothing to do with the school itself, but the type of students and their residents um, who were part of the school. Like one of the first um, presenters, we were able to really predict where they were going to be, and I don't know why everything is moved, so I'm sorry, but we were able to predict where there were going to be peaks in infection. Um, about half of all of our cases occurred after the Halloween holiday in Miami um, and the state of Florida as a whole. Our governor in basically um, tied the hands, if you will, of local government with regard to what could be open curfews. And so around the time of Halloween, there was like a return to normal despite um, a continued increase in the prevalence of cases across the Miami metropolitan area, Orlando and other um, urban, urban, dense area, urban dense regions throughout the state. And so as this happened, bars being reopening, indoor dining being at full capacity, we really started to see an influx of cases, which was really a function of what was occurring across the community and not something that was specific to the university. Okay. So something Corinne was talking about really resonates closely with what we were monitoring at the campus, which is we have on the left, you see a social network diagram where we were able to match the, the new cases to their social or other um, organizational affiliations. And when we would see a cluster of new cases that were related to an organization, we would engage that organizational leadership and then do targeted testing of those students to identify other positives who are potentially asymptomatic. And what you see here is an example of one of our fraternities. And what we found was you know, three new cases in a period of 24 hours among student members of this fraternity and because of that pattern, which looked different than what we would have predicted, we quarantined the entire fraternity and tested them all and actually found 32 new positives. And this was very, very important for us to stay ahead of any outbreak by looking at organizational, organizational affiliations and figuring out who to target for testing based on an observed number of cases that was different than what would be expected through our statistical modeling. We also have a heat map. This is not a traditional heat map, but what we were doing is we were looking at the distribution of cases both on campus and off campus and seeing whether there were any geographic clustering that occurred that again merited sort of this aggressive testing where we would work either with a particular hall in like floor in a residential hall, um, work to message students who lived in a specific off-campus location and have them do additional testing beyond the mandatory testing because the patterns of new infection that we were observing imply that there was an opportunity for intervention with both testing um, what we would call an abridged quarantine until negative test results came back and also the supportive um, information gained by forward and backward contact tracing. This is our contact tracing dashboard in order to manage the demand. We both had traditional contact tracing where um, interviewers would engage with positive individuals to understand who their close contacts were and also to be able to identify their source of exposure. Being able to know uh, where somebody was exposed to infection was a really important metric for us as we are evaluating um, the burden of infection across the campus, across the semester. We also launched um, an online tool that anybody who was positive could fill out. It would send direct notifications to the close contacts, as well as messaging about what close contacts should do in terms of quarantine and isolation, as well as necessary follow-up with student health for any student who was exposed and needed to be tested five to six days post-exposure, as well as linking with our healthcare system for students who are positive 
and we're going to go into isolation. We then arm them with what we call televigilance, which was a Taito device where our nurse practitioners and other healthcare providers could remotely monitor their symptoms to ensure that there wasn't a need for additional medical intervention. And like some of our colleagues on the call earlier, we did have zero hospitalizations and zero deaths, which is obviously very important when you're responsible for the lives of young children. And I believe that all of the things that we were building in this tracking space, the data itself was what helped us inform how to mobilize our resources to ensure that we could stay ahead of any really large outbreak. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm too long. I'm gonna stop so that we can uh, go forward to questions. Great, thank you so much, Erin. I'm sorry it's short for everyone. Um, Shelly, if uh, you're up. All right, I'm gonna talk briefly about super spreading events and how to minimize transmission indoors with engineering control strategies. Uh, we were very active in promoting these strategies here at CU Boulder. And as a result, we had, uh, we had no transmissions within the buildings and I was glad to hear most other universities had the same effect. Uh, but I wanted to highlight, first of all, what we know about the transmission routes. Right now, we know the predominant transmission is happening because of inhalation of virus containing particles that are emitted when you breathe, speak, talk, cough, sing. And you can be exposed to these virus containing particles um, in either the short range or the long range transmission route. Short range means you're really pretty close to the person shedding virus. And in order to disrupt this chain of transmission, you need to interrupt the source and protect yourself from inhalation, which is why we're advocating for very well fitting uh, good masking and also strict social distancing policies. Um, for super spreading events and long range transmission, this is where the engineering controls come into play, where we aggressively increase ventilation rates and we add additional filtration and other air cleaning approaches, including um, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. I want to highlight this over dispersed pathogen idea. You know, we, we follow this R not uh, case to tell us how this disease is spreading, but this is also over dispersed, meaning as few as 10 to 20% of infected people will transmit 80 to 90% of the infections and most people barely transmit at all. We've seen these kinds of um, infectious diseases before SARS and measles were both over dispersed pathogens resulting in a very high uh, skewed number of secondary cases. And a modeling study showed that in order to disrupt this kind of transmission, we need to either reduce our exposed contact rate by you know, 40% or we need to curb um, large gatherings at, um, at less than 10 people. And we can disrupt these super spreading events with ventilation, but we cannot disrupt short, tra short range transmission with ventilation. We did a very in-depth analysis of Skagit Valley Coral rehearsal outbreak that happened in March. Uh, you can read our paper for the details. It is published now in Indoor Air. But this was an 87% transmission super spreading event where uh, we then used a model to understand, well, how could we have decreased transmission during an event such as this? If you just do one one mitigation strategy at a time, like say you increase the ventilation to three air changes per hour, you can reduce the probability of infection to just above 50%. Similarly, if you add filtration or everyone wears a port, uh, surgical mask, or you even shorten the exposure time from two and a half to one and a half, one and a quarter hours, you really can only get around a 50% reduction in transmission or probability of infection. But if you layer this approach and you do all these things indoors, then you can get your probability of infection to below 10%, which is why we're advocating for the layered approach for engineering and mitigation strategies. Um, just a few words about what kind of ventilation we're talking about. This study just uh, was released from the University of Maryland looking at acute respiratory infection cases that were transmitted in dorms. And with dorm room ventilation rates that were lower, we saw much higher transmission of upwards of 50% uh, of the dorm um, inhabitants getting acute respiratory infections. And so from this paper, we can put a lower bound on the ventilation rate that we wanna see indoors to protect against respiratory infection. And that is five liters per second per person. 
On the other end, we know that if you get to 25 liters per second per person, you can really reduce the risk of sick building sim symptoms, increase short-term and decrease short-term sick leave and increase productivity. And so there's this window, uh, which we don't know in great detail what exactly should it be in this window, but I'm advocating for at least 10 liters per second per person. Um, this is a great study of tuberculosis outbreak um, in 2017 in a university in Southeast Asia. When they went in and looked at the ventilation of the buildings that were the where the transmission was occurring, they saw very high levels of carbon dioxide and very low levels of ventilation, uh, less than two liters per second per person. Uh, significant retrofits of the ventilation resulted in a 24 liter per second per person ventilation rate and the CO2 concentrations went from 3000 parts per million indoors to around 600 parts per million. As a result of this study, I'm advocating for carbon dioxide levels indoors to be between 600 and 800 parts per million for infectious disease control. As far as filtration goes, uh, most universities and, and public spaces have tried to increase the ventilation uh, filtration um, to be uh, more effective, but we also have tools that are portable air cleaners. We've been advocating for portable air cleaners in classrooms and every classroom that cannot provide adequate ventilation and filtration at CU Boulder has an air cleaner in it. Uh, we know that we need to size these air cleaners appropriately. You can look at a certified air cleaner through AHAM, that's the sticker on the left that shows if this uh, air cleaner was certified, you can use it in a 300 square foot room. We've also developed a portable air cleaner calculator for schools or anyone who wants to buy one for their home because your homes are notoriously underventilated. So if you're gonna share the air with somebody in your home, you should be opening windows, improving ventilation and running an air cleaner. Um, in addition, uh, we have a really powerful tool, which is a germicidal UV light. Uh, we conducted the seminal studies in my lab that informed the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention policy and guidelines on implementing UV in healthcare facilities. And you would follow this same approach in, in other settings. And we recommend that this upper ger room germicidal UV where you hang lamp fixtures above the occupied zone and you disinfect the upper zone and the lower zone is well mixed into the upper zone, you would, you would implement this kind of technology in larger spaces that you can't supplement with air cleaning and that you know there will be populations in there that may be at risk for um, higher disease um, prevalence and also probably lower um, mitigation strategies could be applied. So things like homeless shelters, jails, um, uh, hospital waiting rooms, for example, and also larger spaces would be a great application. Um, this is the guideline for the CDC for how to use UV and many studies have shown that it's singly the most optimal strategy combined with uh, isolation vaccine, vaccination for airborne infections. Um, the final thoughts that I'd like to leave you with, I didn't say anything about carbon dioxide monitoring. I briefly mentioned it and masks. Uh, a new publication came out showing, you know, these are the kinds of masks that you should be wearing. I advocate for these in schools and I'm now advocating for this to be worn outdoors as well because our, we just cannot get this transmission and case rates under control. And I'm concerned that short exposures, even in close contact outdoors could be risky. Also, you wanna make sure your carbon dioxide is between 600 and 800 parts per million. That just is for outdoor air ventilation. Uh, if you're at 800 parts per million indoors, that indicates that you are inhaling 1% of exhale breaths from others, uh, which could contain the virus. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. D David is in this group. Hi, I'm here, yeah. Okay, great, sorry, go ahead. Start with the end, I guess. And so I'm Dave Larson from Syracuse University. And so I'm gonna talk about our three-pronged approach that we used um, to, to reopen campus. And I'll go quick, because I know we're out of time here. So Syracuse, it's an urban campus, about 22,000 students with a lot of in-residence in dormitories. It's located in central New York, which insulated it from the, from the initial, uh, initial surge of coronavirus in March, April, and May, though we did get some. Um, we, have a, we have a goal for our surveillance, and that's find the infections so we can stop transmission. 
And then I, informally, you know, talking with the administration here, I, I try to reiterate that every time we find an infection through surveillance as opposed to the diagnostics at the clinic, then it's a victory for us. Uh, a lot of our stuff is is outlined, you know, it's not it's not innovative from my perspective. It's just kind of this is what infectious surveillance, infectious disease surveillance is. And so uh, this preprint here is a review that we wrote in March. Um, and just left as a preprint because it's, it's just kind of a handbook almost, I don't know. And so the, the primary the primary pillar of our approach is a contact tracing and you know to break the chains of infections and trace within 24 hours to do this we hired 20 student tracers about one per 2,000 resident or it should that should say one per thousand residents sorry um, that increased over the semester to be about 40 students because we were wanted to use our contact tracers for our mass testing that I'll bring up later we isolated cases in dormitories moved contacts into quarantine and then we made sure we had this firewall between um, between contact contact traces in our code of conduct office that was uh, looking for um, uh, discipline for students. This uh, newspaper article can talk about hiring students as contact traces a bit. We planned our semester with, with a disease elimination strategy, thinking of upstate New York, Onondaga County, Syracuse University as an island, and that our biggest risk of transmission at that time, because it was so low in our county, was importation. And so we did a pre-arrival, arrival, post-arrival post test all within three weeks. And so three tests for each student within three weeks. Um, after that, we, we didn't do a lot of mass testing. We tested before Halloween, we tested before departure. And um, we relied on a lot of volunteers and some paid students. The saliva test was developed by SUNY Upstate. It's the test that Dr. Frank Middleton developed and it's being used across the SUNY system and in other places. Um, this uh, this newspaper article can talk about that. We only considered ever a saliva test um, because nasal pharyngeal swabs as mass surveillance are non-starters. And the test we started using was not FDA approved at the time because the FDA does not approve surveillance tests. And so we'd have a positive, we'd get them a, a diagnostic, an FDA approved diagnostic. We did pooling of groups of 12s at, at Syracuse University. And then we transferred those over to Dr. Middleton's lab for testing. All right. At the, and then the third pillar of ours was wastewater monitoring. And this is dormitory level outside every dorm where you can get access. And that's about 16 points, I believe. And we do two 24 hour composite sample twice weekly. We used a ultra sucrose method that we developed in April as part of our initiative to try to scale a platform in New York. And that's this preprint here, papers under review. Um, and then if we detected coronavirus in the dormitory, we immediately tested everybody. So we followed that up with testing uh, twice, once almost immediately, once three to five days later. The students managed the samples, no problem. And then we used homemade samplers because we had, because the composite samplers we wanted to use were supply chain disrupted. So we, we developed those and there's a, there's a text um, specs, engineering specs there at that location, if you're interested. And so here's our cases at Syracuse. In New York, we, the, the governor of New York would shut us down with 100 cases over a two week period. And we made it through the semester until Halloween, Halloween full moon on a Saturday night. We had a, a number of different um, super spread events and, and that was toward the end of the semester. And so now we're gearing up for next semester. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna ask all the speakers to talk uh, a little bit about um, the, or as relevant to you, the recent CDC study also featured in the New York Times about um, if you look at the aggregate level across the country just by counties that had uh, large universities in person versus not in person, you see more cases in the counties um, that were in person. And we also have examples on this call of schools uh, that definitely weren't, um, weren't increasing the positivity in their area. So I would love um, if we could start uh, with your thoughts on that, Rachel, and then uh, let others jump in. Sure. Thank you. You know, I, I would say that this meeting today is a perfect example of how things can be done differently. I do think we probably do need to do things differently to be successful in the spring. And I think there's incredible examples here today about how to do that successfully, whether that's, you know, upstream factors like routine testing, wastewater testing, really aggressive contact tracing, 
you know, looking at the data closely and looking for acceleration that might be occurring on your campus and, you know, reacting rapidly to that acceleration that you're seeing. I mean, I think those are some examples of, of strategies, but, you know, I, I mean, I, I think like many people around the country worry not just about, you know, elementary schools and secondary schools, you know, not being open right now and the impact that's having on our kids, but, but obviously also on the impact that we're seeing on college students. And, you know, I think we can be successful going forward. And, and again, I get lots of examples here today on how to do that. It, thoughts um, from others on how we might uh, might share these uh, these insights and to a better place collectively. If, if I could talk about the state of New York, um, we observed in the state of New York this exact phenomenon of of the universities driving transmission in the state, and it was universities that didn't have a plan to to test people before they arrived. I think you need a pre-arrival test. You need arrival testing. That movement of people, that big movement of students. Um, between communities is really what drives the transmission and that's a, a fundamental need that all universities should be should be implementing is testing students before they come to to campus and if I can uh, weigh in this is David Luzzi uh, the I, I think this is this is absolutely correct uh, universities that did not implement uh, testing protocols uh, because of budgetary or whatever reasons uh, were the ones that uh, had significant failure, but it was it was also uh, those that did not do a uh, more aggressive campaign involving student behavior. Most of those uh, bad episodes were associated with events that occurred uh, off campus, etc. And a number of universities had to close as a result of that, or reclose as a result of that. I think you heard today. Uh, a suite of solutions that have been developed at universities that show that you can actually tune your approach to get the right economics for your university and be effective. Whether it's uh, PCR testing, antigen testing, sewage testing, pooling, there's a number of strategies that are well developed now. And, uh, and you know, any university can look at these and decide what makes sense for them. Uh, also, I would caution, you know, the CDC is a blunt instrument. They take a, you know, it's gonna be time before nuanced understanding because universities are not one size fits all by any stretch of the imagination. And, uh, and therefore we're gonna need that nuanced information. But uh, also uh, everybody should be aware that student behavior is gonna be a challenge in the spring as vaccinations happen, maintaining that mask wearing inside and outside and all of these things are gonna be extraordinarily important to maintain discipline going forward. And this will be our big challenge and testing will stay with us through the whole spring semester. There's no way to do this spring semester safely without testing. Great, thank you guys for your comments on that. Um, we have uh, just two minutes before we're gonna to transition to panel B. Um, does, uh, could, would anyone like to comment on what might need to change in light of the new strain variant? Sorry, this is David Luzzi again. I can tell you, so we, I don't know if University of Illinois has seen this, but uh, we use the uh, Fisher, uh, Thermo Fisher TAC path, which actually looks at the S genome, uh, the S location on the genome, as does Illinois. And we have started seeing some examples of S gene dropout in our positives. So uh, we are we have uh, brought in we are implementing now G genome sequencing as part of our testing strategy uh, starting this week actually. Uh, so uh, that will be interesting to watch. Um, we are, I think you know, staying the course uh, and just being aware that you may need to pivot uh, to higher frequency testing uh, or, or what it may be is something that we just have to be ready for. Uh, I think the jury is still out on the level of infectivity of this uh, strain. I've seen numbers from 10% to 70%, but, this, but the biochemical based science has not yet been done. It's only been modeling studies. But the, cl the clear messaging is that mask wearing and social distancing are with us um, 
at the front runner of our solutions, right? And uh, along back to what Rachel said about uh, vaccination um, as a strategy, but um, social distancing and mask wearing staying with us um, as a strategy. Okay, great.